I'm here today with the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is a program of the National Academy of Sciences. And we're here to talk about bioethics. Um, what does that have to do with Comic-Con? Um, I have a quick story for you. Um, I imagine some of you have read Stephen King's The Stand. At the beginning of that book, there's a guy named Charles Campion who's working as, uh, he's stationed as a guard at a secret government facility, a secret military facility uh, in the desert in California, not far from where we are. And uh, it's his responsibility to make sure that no one gets in or on or off the base who's not supposed to. And in particular, if anything goes wrong, it's his responsibility to lock down the base and make sure that nobody and nothing gets out. But on the fateful day, when, uh, when the alarm sounds and he realizes that there has been a containment breach and something has gotten out, um, he, uh, he makes a, a quick decision and says, I can't stay here, I have to save my family. And he races across the base and grabs his uh, wife and child, throws them in the car, races out of the base, um, and in the process, he unleashes a super virus on the world that destroys 99% of the population. He just made an ethical decision. And I think uh, we probably all agree that he made the wrong one because he killed the vast majority of people on the, pl the planet and unleashed the apocalypse. Um, but uh, these sorts of decisions are the basis for a lot of uh, our favorite stories, and we're gonna talk about a few of those things today. Alongside me to discuss this are uh, my two friends, uh, Mike Kalichnik. Kalichman. Kalichman, oh my God, sorry. And <laughs> Felicia Cohn. And would you guys please tell us a little bit about who you are and what you guys do? Go ahead, Mike. Okay. okay. So um, I'm a scientist who got interested in ethics some years ago, and that interest led me to create a center for ethics in science and technology, which is directly relevant to what we're doing here today. My presumption is that we have some wonderful benefits coming down the line from science and technology, but those benefits come with risks and potential harms. The best way to deal with that is not just to trust a few people, to address those questions, but to have everybody thinking about those issues. And one way to do that is the entertainment industry provides us with opportunities to think about those issues before they happen and ask, what would I do if I was faced with being a security guard and a virus that will kill everyone, kill life as we know it is going to be released? What should right. I do? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm Felicia Cohn. I am the bioethics director for Kaiser Permanente in Orange County. I'm also a clinical professor at the University of California, Irvine. My background is actually in religious ethics, that I wanted to work in the healthcare field, so spend most of my time in hospitals, where we deal with those questions every day. There are a lot of things we can do. My job is to help figure out what we should do. All right, um, so let's dive in. Uh, please um, tweet us your questions and comments and uh, we'll try to see if we can bring any of those up. Um, uh, first off, um, let's talk about the movie Gattaca. Um, so Gattaca, if you guys remember, um, is a movie about uh, a, a near future um, where genetic modification has become commonplace to the point where um, the, the vast majority of people on the planet now have been modified in some way to, to at the very least, filter out diseases, uh, but also to make them stronger, more attractive, more intelligent. Um, and the people who don't have those modifications have become something of, a, of an underclass in society. Um, so I guess I'd love for you guys to walk us through how likely is this, how close is this, what's going on that's like this, and what are the ethical questions that we should be thinking about? To, I'll, I'll jump in first on the, the science part, is that we are doing genetic, genetic modification of a variety of organisms now. This is not just a question of um, a technology that may never come to pass. This one is there, and really the main limitations right now are the decision not to be doing right. very much of this in human organisms, but we know that we are genetically modifying other species. We've been actually genetically modifying species for many thousands of years, but in the laboratory now, genetic modifications of plants and animals are already going on. Right. Well, since Mendel and his peas, who we all learned about in elementary school, mm. we've been making changes. Not always on purpose, but you know, we change our food, we change animals to better suit our needs, and we can do that with human beings. And there are a lot of 
experiments, a lot of research now to cha make changes that all, I think we would all agree on for the better, to eliminate life-threatening diseases, to eliminate disabilities or whatever in our current definitions constitutes disabilities. But just two days ago, the Newfield Council of Bioethics in the United Kingdom decided maybe it is okay to modify human embryos in ways that they said would benefit that person, that, that baby. And we don't know what that means yet. That might be opening a door, might be opening a door to changing human right. beings. Because once you change the genes, you haven't just changed one person. You've changed every person that that person creates. So can I clarify, you said we have the ability to make these changes about removing diseases or disabilities, but we don't have the, the government authorization to do so? Is that the, except now we in England? We have some ability. Okay. We can't do all that we would like to do. I right. can't decide today that I want, you know, a perfect, you know, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, athletic, high IQ baby. Mm -hmm. We don't have the ability to do that yet. Right. We do have the ability to change some things hopefully for the better. The problem is right now the technology can also be harmful. So like any other treatment, you know, you take too much Tylenol and it helps your head, but then maybe it shuts down your liver. Right. So there are side effects and we need to be aware of those too. Right. Well, I think that there's also the questions of what are we saying when we're, when we're talking about eliminating disabilities or for that matter on a more basic level, um, I know people already who are making choices about what gender they want their baby to be. Um, what does that pose in, in our society, in other cultures around the world, the you know, preference for one gender over another, um, the challenges that that presents us? Right, well we look at countries where that's been a common practice, right. and now they have too many men, right. and not enough women. It's hard to make babies without enough women. Right. So there are lots of implications to every decision that we make like that. And you know, how much farther are we going to go? I, I do clinical ethics, so I deal with real people, real questions, real requests. And I had a couple once, they both were deaf. One was deaf from birth. One was deaf by uh, some accident that occurred later in his life. And they were very much part of the deaf community, and they wanted their future children to be deaf. And they came to our medical center asking that's that their really children be screened, their embryos be screened, so that they could have a deaf baby. Huh. So is that okay? You know, I think most people would say if you wanted to screen against deafness, given our current cultural biases, that that would be acceptable. But is it okay to do the opposite? And what makes one wrong and one right? Right. That's, that's really interesting. I certainly know people in the deaf community who would say, I, uh, I am glad that I'm deaf. I, my family chose against giving me a cochlear implant. Um, the deaf community is, is an active culture. I actually had the chance uh, recently in, uh, in Tel Aviv to participate in an activity at a museum that gives you the experience of being deaf for a limited period of time. Um, and it was really interesting to kind of rely on your other senses and see what a different life experience that is. Um, but that's fascinating to, to know that it's a choice sort of after birth is one thing for people to choose to have a deaf child is something I haven't mm -hmm. heard of before. That's yeah. really interesting. Well, fortunately, the question at the time was easy because we didn't have the technology to actually make that happen. Right. There so you go. we could say no in good conscience. But, you know, as, that, as technology right. progresses, what will we say? Mm -hmm. yeah, so just say to the extent that um, this can be genetically determined and we can make that choice, People might want to, and, and for those um, listening into this podcast who are hearing, they might find this appalling to think that somebody would choose for their child to be deaf. But think of it another way. Imagine that you could not easily communicate with your children in the language mm -hmm. you speak. Right. And the deaf community has a way of communicating that... Um, if you learn from birth, you're very comfortable with it, you have the nuance, you communicate well. What happens if you pull that apart? You've got two deaf parents and a child who's being brought up in the hearing community, and that child is able to communicate better in that world than in your world. And that's something that you, many of us could well understand why they would choose that. Mm -hmm. And so the question we're going to be asking today for all of these issues is, what should we do, right. and who gets to decide? Is this something that each individual gets to decide for mm -hmm. himself or herself, or is this something that we want society to regulate? 
Right. And if so, what do those regulations look like? Right. Um, what other sorts of, what are the things that we know are kind of, what do we assume is a given that we want to screen against? What are the, the obvious, like, these are the things that we are now, what is in practice? Oh, I think there's, I, there's, you know this probably better than I do. No, I don't actually know. Oh, okay. Okay, got it. Um, well, I would assume we talked about the idea of certain, you know, uh, diseases that, are, that pretty much make it impossible for a child to, uh, to grow up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that we probably aren't in a position to give you a list of things. Sure. But one of the keys here is that most characteristics of people are determined not just by one gene. Mm -hmm. So you might have to look for several. But let's say that um, two people, a couple, have decided to have a child. They have embryos made in vitro in the laboratory, and then they want to choose among those embryos. So they could test those embryos genetically. And one example of something that they definitely would want to remove would be the gene that determines having Huntington's chorea. Mm. Specific disease. Sure. Mm -hmm. a disease which you don't see any evidence of until I believe you're in your 30s or 40s. Mm -hmm. um, but at that point, it's a difficult, horrific disease from which you will likely die early. Mm -hmm. um, that would be something that you wouldn't wish on your future child. So you choose an embryo that doesn't have that characteristic. Mm -hmm. right. Very different than saying, I'm going to go into this embryo and choose genes that are going to make this child taller or have blonde hair. Right. Right. And part of why we can't answer that question is because in most countries, testing or experimenting on human embryos is not allowed. Right. It's specifically illegal in a number of countries, and other countries just don't speak to it at all. So it just hasn't happened, which is why that report out of the United Kingdom right. was so stunning, because yeah. it might start happening now. Sure. And what is that going to mean? Mm -hmm. And we already are doing things like what Mike was talking about. You know, we have couples who have a child with a serious illness who needs maybe an organ transplant or a bone marrow transplant and they're having trouble finding a matching donor. And so they will conceive another child right. through in vitro fertilization using pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to determine what the likelihood of each of those embryos of having that disease are or of being a genetic match to their already existing child. Then they will implant that embryo right. that is the best match, that is disease-free, at least that disease-free, mm -hmm. and bear that child and then take parts of that child, whether it be stem cells from the umbilical cord or bone marrow or as the child gets older, a kidney um, or part of a liver to mm -hmm. implant or to put into the other child who's been ill. Right. And so you're giving birth to one child to save another child. Which actually kind of moves us into our next topic. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll reference, uh, we've got two movies, um, off the, actually three off the top of my head, that, that uh, touch this subject of the idea of um, creating a life to sustain another life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, think first of Never Let Me Go. Um, and this group of people who have lived a, uh, a I, I remember you, you're trying to figure out at first, like what actually, what is, what is wrong with these people? What's, you, what's special about their experience when you realize that they've basically, that these are clones who've been created to provide organs to other people and that their entire life is controlled. And yet there are still people with emotions um, who, who want to be able to live full, uh, meaningful lives. Um, uh, the Island is another that did that, and uh, My Sister Keeper is the, the less sci-fi, and actually probably, there, I, I would imagine there are true stories that are identical to that. Um, but with less twists and turns. Probably with a few less twists and turns, but you never know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, let's talk about the morality of that, the ethics of that, of creating a life to sustain another life. Um, so you want to give us a bit of a... Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's human identity. You know, we have children because we want a child. And here the purpose for having a child is to save another child. So what is that second child's identity? Right. And what if it fails? Mm -hmm. If I'm born to give my bone marrow to my older sister right. and she dies anyway, and now my parents are stuck with me and I haven't saved my sister, who they already loved, are, how are they going to feel about me? 
I'd like to think they'd still love that child. Right. And so far, I think in the situations where this has happened, it hasn't been a detriment to that child. Mm -hmm. But I have to wonder about growing up knowing that you were born to save someone and you couldn't do that. Is this something that's actually like relatively commonplace? Does this happen no. a lot? No, not a lot. Okay. Um, the thing that I thought was particularly interesting about um, uh, the example of my sister's keeper is the idea of at a certain point that child is going to know why they were created and what uh, and what the life is that they have to look forward to at least uh, you know until their sibling is healthy. Um, so. Uh, at what, who, ultimately, when does, when does a person get to take control of their own, uh, you know, health and well-being and, and make the decision of, I don't want to have these procedures anymore. I love my sister, but it can't be my obligation to. Right. I love my sister, but I don't want surgery. Yeah. I'm scared. Right. Or what if I need that kidney later? And shouldn't, I mean, I guess the parents are ultimately, the parents are the ones making these decisions up until there's, there is resistance to it. Um, <laughs> I would assume you must have doctors who are looking out for both patients, patients separately. There are. There are different doctors. You know, for any transplant procedure, there are always two different teams, so there isn't that conflict of interest. But there's still going to be overlap. And as the child gets older, you know, it's easy to consent for, a, for an infant or a toddler. But you know, by the time kids are four or five, yeah. anyone who's a parent knows they have very strong wills of their own. And how do you... You know, getting a child to take antibiotics when they don't want to take the yucky tasting medicine is hard enough. Getting right. them into an operating room, mm -hmm. you know, against a child's free will, even if they're not an adult, they don't legally have any rights to make decisions, but they still have their own beliefs, feelings, desires. Right. And to go against that and then still have to raise that child, mm -hmm. how do you do that? Yeah, to be clear also, um, in our legal system in this country, um, that child, even though they may not be able to make a lot of legal decisions for themselves, on, in almost every setting would be asked to give assent. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. could say no. This, is, uh, this and the example that Felicia gave of maybe it won't work are reminders of what we are looking at when we look at cases like this. We are almost never looking at certainty. Mm -hmm. We're not almost ever able to say, if you do X, this is what's going to happen. If right. you would, a lot of ethical discussions would be a lot easier. So in a world where we have uncertainty, what kinds of decisions do we want to make? Who gets to make those decisions? Sure. What value do we see of creating a human life? What does that mean in this case that we've actually chosen to have a human being for a particular outcome that may or may not ever occur? And should we be allowed to do that? Right. How do you protect against that if you say you're not allowed to do that? Um, I have sort of a very sci-fi proposal, but I, f I feel like this must, must be discussed, but um, I assume research is being done to try to create those, create organs, create bone marrow, create those things independent of an entire human mm -hmm. so that you could just create the specific item that you need, or for that matter, to create a human that doesn't have any sort of brain. Um, tell me what that brings up for you. <laughs> so... It's certainly a direction we can go in, and some pieces of that are already being worked on. Um, but it is extraordinarily scary figuring out how we're going to draw those lines. Mm -hmm. Personally, I feel pretty comfortable saying, if you could, draw, if you could grow a kidney for me in sure. vitro, just a kidney that is perfectly matched for me and replaced my defective kidney, mm -hmm. I feel, well, that sounds fine. Right. If you go to that level that you just described, maybe create an entire human, mm -hmm. but with no brain. Right. Who's going to start drawing the distinctions? Because you will need some level of brain for basic bodily function. Sure. How is it going to breathe? So you say, okay, well, we'll have a brain stem and autonomic nervous system, various things. So... You could say, well, we're not going to have cortical functions, but there are various things you might need. I mean, things that we do normally, and, the, and this is why if you have dementia, you may die because you aren't able to do normal functions that would help protect you from fluid accumulation mm -hmm. in your lungs, for example. So how much of a brain do we give someone? And so you could start saying, well, we could have almost an entire brain, but we just drug them. 
so that they aren't aware of what's going right. on. And as you move the, that line further and further back, suddenly you're creating human beings, um, real human beings. What are, the, what are the restrictions on doing that today? Well, it's just not done. <laughs> well, and we're still arguing over what constitutes a human being sure. oh, and the death of a human being more specifically. Right. So if you're creating a human being who has no brain or less of a brain, are they still a human being? Right. Or are they dead? Well, and then we start getting into some of the, these other apocalyptic, you know, walking dead kind of scenarios people who aren't really alive but also aren't really dead. Mm -hmm. The definition of brain death you know, is something we thought was sort of settled, ethical and medical right. issue, but it's not. Yeah. You know, we had the case in the last few years of Jahai McMath, who was in the news constantly, declared dead by neurologic criteria, brain dead. Mm -hmm. But her parents argued she was still alive. And in some states, New York, New Jersey, there are exemptions in the law where if you don't accept brain death, then you're not dead. Hmm. So there's a death certificate in California, but she was still alive in New Jersey. Wow. And could you take her organs? You know, if she's dead right. and still on machines, could we have harvested her organs if her parents didn't believe she was dead? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would that have meant? And right. could we bury her if she's still breathing? Huh. Well, hopefully she wouldn't still be breathing when she's buried, but that's a, yeah. Yeah, and breathing may not be your only criterion for right. what it means to be right. alive. What, what is one of the wonderful things about science is it's giving us a window now into things we couldn't have anticipated before. It's giving us opportunities we couldn't have anticipated before. One of them is to even harvest organs in the first place. Mm -hmm. But now the question of when you're going to use someone's organs is extraordinarily difficult. There, there is a group in Canada, and there may be others as well, that has been using a technique called functional magnetic resonance imaging mm -hmm. to look at the brains for people who we believe are in effectively a vegetative state. They will never recover function. And using that technique, asking them questions and setting it up so they believe they can get that that person, if they have any control of their brain, can actually answer those questions and discovering that some of these people who we thought are in a vegetative state are actually able to consciously answer, hear things they have heard and come up with a response to that. I'm not guaranteeing that those people really have function in the way we think of function, right. but it, again, is opening up a window into something that we wouldn't have even considered just 20 years ago. Okay. Um, I feel like we should move on to a slightly more, uh, I don't know if this is, I mean, this is a fun topic for me, but um, we talked about a minority report and the idea of being able to predict future bad behavior. And as science develops, we're learning how to uh, look for markers in people's uh, genetics and also in, their, in other aspects of their anatomy that can indicate that they might have a future inclination towards um, criminal activity. So can you give us, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about about yeah, this. Well, first, I have to remind people in the minority report, I believe the terminology was precogs. Precogs, yes. This is a little different than an actual precog yeah, who yeah, is. Yeah, so we're not talking about this in the real world, but just, you know, the, the idea was intriguing that with these precogs, these individuals that are basically um, nurtured in order to predict the future, what's going to happen with an individual. We have no mechanism in science that I know of that's actually going to work on that. Right. But the idea is intriguing, that you could somehow predict whether an individual is going to, for example, commit a murder. Mm -hmm. And so the presumption in this movie, based on a novel from Philip K. Dick, or a story from Philip K. Dick, mm -hmm. is that you could stop somebody before they committed the crime because you know the crime they're going to commit. First thing to point out is the same thing I mentioned earlier most things we deal with are matters of probability, right. not certainty. And that's ultimately sort of the, the much of the plot of that movie has to do with right. flaws in that system. Exactly. So, so now let's translate that into something we can do. And one of the things we can do is we can measure neurotransmitters in people's brains. We can look at brain anatomy. We can measure brain function under certain circumstances. In every one of those cases, we might ask questions about um, what are the characteristics of somebody who would do X? Mm -hmm. What are the characteristics of somebody who would commit a crime? 
So what if we found that 95% of people who have this feature are likely to go on to a life of crime? What should we do with that information? Should we sequester them? But then what about the 5% somehow? of those people who don't? I yeah. think that the we talked a little bit about the... Um, the James Fallon TED Talk, um, which I, I, I watched honestly more than once um, because I have a certain uh, interest in sociopaths. Um, they make great <laughs> subjects for movies. Yes, um, so uh, the, as I recall that, um, and I think you guys might remember other elements of this, uh, of this talk, but he had done a series of PET scans on brains of sociopaths and had found um, certain patterns or elements that were consistent among sociopaths. But I also remember that uh, reading somewhere, or, or pos I, I don't remember if this was part of his talk, but that not all, not all people who have that brain are going to become violent serial killers. Um, not all people who have, who have that brain are going to become uh, criminals. Um, they might be perfectly functional members of society and we would never know that they have this problem. Um, and I remember there was something about uh, a trauma in childhood is what kind of flips the switch for many of these people that turns them from relatively ordina ordinary members of society into mass murderers. Um, so, uh, but that's, that's probably a small percentage of people who have that kind of brain. Uh, so, well, if, so the, f the first question is how many people have that pattern? And I remember the work, but I don't remember the percentage. Sure, I yeah. think it is a small percentage. I think you're right. The idea that certain triggers are necessary along with this makes some sense. But again, since you don't know whether somebody's going to get that trigger. Right. And the que a really good question is what is a trigger for somebody? I mean, for somebody who has lived a life of ease and you know, has everything brought to them any time, a trigger might be that they can't see the movie they want to see today. <laughs> I mean, right. and for somebody else, the trigger might be that um, they have no food and um, they are at risk of being killed in order to try and survive. So that's not something that we can predict. It's not something we can say for, with certainty, this is the factor that's going to lead to this, to this possible outcome. So what as a society do we want to do with that? How do we, right. uh, it's, it's kind of knowledge that you might not be able to act on or you might not want to act on. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it's, it's similar to, to medicine. You know, we all have within us certain genes that if triggered could result in disease. Mm -hmm. So do I go and presumptively have certain of my body parts removed as right. you do if you have the breast cancer gene? You don't have breast cancer yet, but do you treat it as if you're right. going to have it? Do you just make that assumption when we really don't know? And lots of diseases are like that. Yeah, although I think what's interesting is in that, and this goes back to the question of who makes these decisions, but when you have that situation, it's my choice how, what I decide to do with that information. But uh, if the government has the ability, I'm, I'm saying the government with like, yep. you know, a large G, um, has, the, has the ability to, to, to measure this in people, when do they, does this become sort of standard testing at some point in time? When you're born or before you're born, um, are, are there tests that can be done to show what, uh, whether or not you have the likelihood of becoming a criminal? And if you have that likelihood, what kind of restriction? I mean, that's the, um, what kind of restriction do you put on that life? Uh, can you ever, do you just have people monitoring them? Um, should we be uh, implementing any, court, any sort of uh, system to, to you know, test our children for these things as they're going through school. Well, we do in other ways. Okay. You know, we do drug testing. Mm -hmm. You know, as a requirement for my current job, I had to undergo drug testing. Right. So what would it have meant if I'd had a positive result and claimed, but I'm not a drug user? Right. You know, what does that mean? And what restrictions would that mean for me? And we do that with other illnesses too. Um, tuberculosis. You test positive for tuberculosis, they're going to start you on Medicaid, the government. It's right. going to require you be quarantined, start you on medication so it doesn't result in a public health threat, you know, an outbreak. But what if you're not symptomatic? What if you're fine? And now they've told you for six months you can't, can't leave your house and you have to take this medication. Right. And I, I feel to some degree that the, the answer to these questions probably changes over time. And it depends on like, the culture that we're living in at the moment. Um, 
the question of, I mean, I guess the question of what sort of tolerance do we have for putting, for locking up innocent people, people who, who would never do something like this, um, and what tolerance do we have for that matter in locking up people who, uh, who have never done anything but are highly likely to? Yeah. Well, in, in all those cases, again, this probability issue, um, we already make these kinds of decisions in society. We make choices about what is the risk that if I lock this person up, that I am wrong in doing so. And you could say, well, we should never lock up anybody who isn't guilty, and we should only lock up people who are guilty. Mm -hmm. But just look at but the way... But by whose definition? Yeah, but just look right. at the way courts define guilt. You hear terms like beyond a reasonable doubt, preponderance of the evidence. You don't hear absolute certainty because you almost never have absolute mm -hmm. certainty. Mm -hmm. And I think if you would go into society, ask the people who are listening in to this discussion, there are a lot who will say, I would rather err on the side of making a mistake and not imprisoning somebody mm -hmm. because I don't want innocent people locked up. Right. And there are That's certainly my say, leaning. Yes, yeah, and that's, you know, because I don't want to be locked up personally. But there are others who would say, I am so fearful mm -hmm. of what might happen because of some criminal out there that I would rather lock up anybody who might be a criminal. Right. Um, this is a question of society. You, you mentioned different societies might have different right. questions. A society makes its decisions. We make those decisions by our votes, by our sure. um, input for how we think we should operate. And the same society may change over time. That's, I mean, we yeah. locked up Japanese people during the war because they were Japanese people. Right. And now we think that's wrong. A lot of people probably thought it was wrong then as well, yet it happened. Hope. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well... We're moving through these kind of quickly. Okay, let's, we, we've got plenty. <laughs> so so um, maybe um, sort of as a, an aside to this topic is um, if, you're, if you're talking about predicting behavior, the question is what can we see in a human that tells us what, what their inclination is, what they might yeah. do? And one side topic that we were considering talking about today, I think it might be worth considering is, mm -hmm. what about lie detection? So what if right. you could look into somebody's brain and tell if they were lying or not? And at the risk of doing some advertising, but actually I don't know if it's still the name of the company, there is a company in San Diego um, that, I won't give their name because I don't remember the name for sure, <laughs> but, but the company that uses MRI for detecting whether someone is lying or not. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of work done on this. You, you send, put somebody in this magnetic resonance image machine, usually used, most of us think of it for looking for um, brain abnormalities or something, for example, if you're looking at the brain. In this case, using it to look at function in different areas of the brain and seeing which areas of the brain are changed when somebody is telling the truth versus when they are being deceptive. And on the surface, just as I asked, it sounds like, well, that'd be easy to do. Just put people in when they're lying and people when they're telling the truth. Mm -hmm. But I need to point out that that's not easy. We can come back to why it's not easy. But let's assume you thought you had done that with a reasonable level of confidence. Now you stick somebody in the machine, and by having them in this machine, you can ask them a question and find out whether they're lying. So what if we could have that machine at the airport? Everybody well, going this is through the, the question I had was how much of this is practical to implement in, uh, without, without, you know, putting somebody in a machine. I will, I will stipulate right now that if you think lines are long at security at the airport right, now, right. imagine trying to put people into a machine where you have to repeatedly ask them the questions and mm -hmm. it would basically nobody would ever fly. Right. Um, but that's the kind of, you know, every technology starts out very expensive, very slow, very cumbersome. I mean, look at our the cell phones we carry around now and compare that to... To the mainframes that took up <laughs> right. the size of this room. Mm -hmm. right. so, and that's just in our lifetimes. Right. Yeah. So possibly in the not distant future, we'll have... Yeah, I, well, I'm... Yeah. Fingerprint scanners for lying. So in terms of the distance of the future, there was an interesting story I saw a few years ago that said that whenever somebody's in a panel like this one and somebody asks them, well, when will this be? They always say, this is five years away. Right. Five years is sort of the perfect point. <laughs> far enough to say, okay, well, I know there's still work to be done. Sure. But it's soon enough. It sounds, oh, this is imminent. The real answer is 
you don't know. Yeah. Because um, people are working on these questions from all different directions, and somebody might have an insight, a lucky breakthrough, and suddenly the impossible becomes commonplace. Right. And affordably. And affordably. Well, I actually think this is a really good lead into uh, to our next topic, um, which uh, I think the best movie example we had of this was iRobot. Um, uh, in iRobot, we have uh, robots that are now a part of our everyday lives, and they have been um, coded with, uh, with a series of principles, the primary of which is you cannot hurt any human. Um, and... Uh, we see today that uh, we, have, we have AI around us in a lot of different ways becoming increasingly common. And um, we, are, we are entrusting these systems to make decisions about our well-being. Um, so driverless cars being, um, being the topic that, uh, that, we, that we started discussing. Um, what do we do when there is a situation where there's a person outside the car who is at risk and there's a person inside the car who's at risk and we are leaving it in the hands of AI to make the decision of which life is more important? So please, tell us more about this. I think the question there is what algorithm would you program into the car yeah. to make that decision, which is still going to be human-based. So it's still going to be human biases guiding the machine, mm -hmm. at least until AI truly becomes I. You know, human sure. machines truly become intelligent. Yep. But to do that, the machine would have to experience emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I don't think anyone has figured out. I mean, there are humans who don't experience enough emotion, right. much less machines. So how would you calculate that? And then how would the machine have any way of knowing who that person behind their wheel is which would be easier for them to know than who that person outside of the car right, right. is to make that value judgment. And then what is it based on? And it reminds me of the, when we first started doing kidney dialysis. Mm -hmm. The machines were enormous and expensive, and a hospital may have just one or two. Right. And so much need. So many people in kidney failure who would benefit, whose lives would be extended by access to this machine. So they had to make those decisions. And how do you do that? Right. You and have to some degree, that's, that exists in now you. in terms of like organ donation and who is the recipient right. of those organs. Right. There are the criteria that we use to decide who is, who's at the top of that list. Yes. But you know, at the time, Congress couldn't decide. Right. Couldn't decide. And they were the deciders because they were funding it. So they made it available to everyone. So it is probably the only service that is 100% funded by the government. Your kidneys fail, you will get dialysis. Right. And it will be paid for. Oh, that's interesting. And because we couldn't decide. Huh. But at the time, you know, they had groups of people who needed this. So you know, maybe it's easy to say, well, we'll do the children. We'll make sure the children get this first because they're young and innocent and deserve it, deserve a chance to grow up. But then what if there's a physician among that group who yep. could help save some of those children? He's doing all his research on kidney transplantation. Mm -hmm. He could save these children. So maybe you save him. And then maybe there's the mother who has five children, and maybe you need to save her so those children don't become orphans. Right. But then we get into the harder questions where what if the person who needs it is a prisoner, you know, an in or an inmate, and are they, they're still a human being? Are they worthy? And so there were committees set up to do this that made social judgments. Mm -hmm. And that, as you can imagine, became problematic. Right. And so it became medical criteria. But even in the medical criteria, bias sneaks in because you have to have, like for a transplant, for example, you have to have um, not been drinking if you want a liver transplant. You have to have demonstrated that you can abstain for six months or more. So is that a social judgment or a medical judgment? Right. Or both. Right. And you have to have a support system. So if you're homeless and don't have family to help you make sure that you take your meds every day, which seems like a reasonable criteria. Sure. You have to be compliant so we don't waste the organ, but is that really a social judgment because you're homeless and don't have loved ones right. who can help you? Mm -hmm. So the kidney example is a really good example of what we would do with perfect information, and even with what I'm going to call quote unquote perfect information is still tremendously complex and value based and judgments may vary. But when you or I drive a car, much less when a, a car that is autonomous and 
making decisions on its own. In all of those cases, we don't have the nuance of whether that person standing on the sidewalk that we would have to hit in order to avoid hitting that other car. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether they're a PhD scientist, whether they are a drug addict, whether they are you, the president of the United States. We don't know who they are. And so the car is now having to make decisions in other ways. What, I, what I'm starting to picture, though, is as facial, te as facial recognition technology develops, um, and we're programming AI to make these sorts of decisions, we're going to get to a point where um, where the car is going to be able to know, ah, that person out there who has a, uh, who, who is a doctor who's doing important research, and this person in this car who has the brain pattern of a sociopath, I'm going to choose to save the guy out there. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I that, mean, that feels that's, like that's actually not that that's far really in the good, future. It's a good example, although what I think is more likely is not that that will rely on face recognition, but I can easily envision a future in which people allow themselves, if not are forced, to be identified with some sort of tag so that that tag would be providing the information to let the car know. And so now, I mean, you know, for those, again, for those listening, I mean, they might ask themselves at this point, so if I'm in my autonomous car, do I want it to protect me no matter what? That's the first choice. Right. And I think most of us start with that assumption. I'm the driver, of course I would want that. But then if you step back and say, what do I want the society to do? You'd say, well, if the car could choose saving one person or saving three people, mm -hmm. the car might hit three people otherwise, you'd say, well, save the three people and that one person should die. Right. Then you start getting to the nuance of if you could know who they were, that's probably the question I think furthest out. And the question for all of these that we should start with every one of these questions is the science. What can we actually do? How good is the recognition, the visual recognition a car can do of its environment? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're still working on. But if you Along start with that assumption, like an iRobot, mm -hmm. where the artificial intelligence cannot harm a human being, mm -hmm. then could the machine even work? If it's put into a situation where someone is going to be harmed. It would sort of have like a, a shutdown effect right. if there is no option that uh, that, that wouldn't preserves, harm a human being. Right. Yeah, I forgot the exact wording, but I think that it, I know, there, the wording the was wording such too. that, um, you know, if you had to choose between two human beings and one, you might choose mm -hmm. losing one life instead of two, things of, of that sort. But that, you know, still is a human bias that we are presupposing one really philosophical theory is better than another. Yep. Mm -hmm. That and life doesn't have absolute value, that it's all relative. Right. Yeah, so the, one of the things that's really intriguing is to try and dig deep and think, what kind of level of intelligence are we looking for? We think of ourselves as a gold standard and we're pretty bad. So now imagine a robot, a device, an artificially intelligent device we've created, and can it get the nuance? So we have Siri now and other devices where we can talk to them and ask them for something. What if they give us information that would cause us to lose our life? But they have no context to know that because they told you, turn right here, that a meteor is going to hit there or something. I, you know, sure. Same idea. Sure. So they can't always make the decision that would mm -hmm. protect life. And we should not make the assumption that our technology will do any better at this than we can. Right. And we don't do a very good job of it. <laughs> um, I'm noticing in the chat right now that there's a discussion that's happening about what we were talking about earlier with regard to harvesting organs to use on another child. Um, I, th I think we should like clear up some confusion here. Sure. Um, because they said, wait, they kill the other kid? If they need to, yes. Okay. Just to be clear, we're not yeah. actually talking about that. <laughs> Let's no. have a vote on that. I think all three of us are in favor of not killing. All, of, all three of us are in favor of not killing anybody. Uh, but also, we are not, we are not having one child specifically to, to give their organs to another. So that might be the premise of that movie, right? Never let me go, but it was not. No, that's, that's the real that, life. Those situation. aren't, and actually, those aren't children. Those are clones. Those are clones. Um, those are those are rich people paying for duplicates of themselves as backups. Um, that's also fiction. Um, so just to be clear, 
but, there, but in fairness, there have been discussions. Which is not yet possible for humans. Cloning, not yet possible for humans. For a kidney, which you can lose one kidney and still be absolutely fine in most cases, there have been discussions. Um, I don't know whether any of, and Felicia may know whether, how often that's actually come to fruition, if ever, where families would say, um, there is a known risk of somebody needing a kidney and to have a good match. If we had another child, then that child would be able to develop to donate that kidney. Right. It would not be to kill that child to right. take that kidney. No. But the presumption would be that child would be able to give up their kidney for someone else. Right. Getting into all the right. questions we talked about. And we do that now. Not yeah. We don't necessarily procreate to create a donor, but there are living donors who opt to give up a kidney or a part of a liver yeah. to save usually a family member, but sometimes a stranger. Do you know, it's interesting. And we have, we have five minutes left, and I know that there's a, top, there's some, there's a subject I wanted to come back to as, uh, uh, for our wrap-up. But the one thing I was going to say specifically about kidneys, because it occurred to me after we stopped talking about that, um, I read about a case years ago about, in fact, uh, a serial killer, like a, a, a very serious serial killer, um, uh, who found out that he was a match for some, I think it was the brother of an ex-girlfriend or something like that, um, uh, who needed a kidney donated. And this inmate wanted to be able to donate a kidney. Um, and there, it became a big court case of whether or not the court would allow him to, uh, to donate that... Um, that, uh, that kidney or whether he's being co coerced into doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah, prisoners are actually in a special category in our population. You know, we, we think of them as just being restricted, but they are actually protected in specific ways because of their lack of freedom. And so there is that concern that they're being coerced, that maybe they'll get a shorter sentence, maybe there's some benefit to them right. if they will donate. And then I was just reminded of a movie, and I can't recall what it's called, that Will Smith starred in, that he, he wanted to become an organ donor, mm. and he set about finding all of his recipients. Oh, right. I think it was seven pounds, was it? I think so. Called? Right. And then he went about killing himself in a particular way so that his organs would still be viable. That's, and that, he yeah. had figured out who he wanted his liver, his kidney, his heart, his lungs to go to. Mm -hmm. And that... And you, know, you have to question what, what's the motivation behind that? If you're going to be a living, unrelated donor, you're not doing this to save your brother, your mother, your right. child, why are you donating? And I see somebody saying, kidneys for sale? Um, <laughs> it's nope. still illegal. Still illegal. Still illegal to sell a kidney. <laughs> still illegal to buy a kidney. Yes. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, all of this is, it really comes back to that, that question again of, um, of Who entertainment oh, okay. we can get from it. I mean, yeah. that's kind of the fun, why we're here. Sure. I mean, that, that, you know, you, you go to a sci science fiction movie and maybe you like to see things blown up and, you know, people running in chases, whatever. But those allow us to think ahead of time about challenges that we may actually be facing already or which we may face in the future. And being able to do that is a valuable thing. So we should, we can pat ourselves on the back and say there's good reason to go and watch that next <laughs> Blockbuster. Yeah, well, right. TV shows, movies, comic books, they allow us to play these scenarios out. Yeah. So we can see what is the end? What, what are the possibilities? Right. And right now, we have the latitude in the media to play it out in ways that really aren't possible. Mm -hmm. But you never know where the mind will go. Right. Well, and it's, it's exciting to see... Uh, how we feel about subjects before they're put into action in the world, and what would we do uh, if we were in that situation? Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I was asked earlier today why it is that, that as a film person I am participating in this, uh, this science organization, and it's because this subject matter to me is so fascinating, it becomes the basis for so many of my favorite stories. Um, so it's, it's just, it's really worthwhile to kind of expose ourselves to um, these different ideas. Yeah, um, exchange is so helpful too because it gives us the chance to talk to scientists, to talk to entertainment people, have them connect so yeah. that there is some reality in the science fiction we get to see and think about. Right. I certainly like that. Um, I think that's about all we have time for today. So um, I, I have no idea who your next, uh, your next panel up here is today, but um, you should stay tuned and enjoy what they've got for you. Okay, so thanks. Thank you. Thank you.